Okay, welcome to Teach Me to Parent. We're glad you're with us again today, and we have a great program for you. We have Jerry Brenneman, who is the retired executive director of Evangel Home here in downtown Fresno, and has served in that capacity for 30 years. Oh, well, he served in the retirement part for five months. In five months, now retired. director for 30 years. Yeah, you're still in your <laughs> mindset of working. I'm sure you are. I am. But yeah. we're going to take a look at what Evangel Home is, but also the kind of people they serve and some of the unique aspects of the people that you've been serving for 30 years and some of the successes and accomplishments you've had. And I'm sure you've had your failures, you know, as well, which leads me to a quote that I want to give you just before we start our program today and put it in perspective, okay? And the quote says this, life is a series of accomplishments and failures that begins with learning to walk. In other words, that's all of us. We're all in the same boat. We all have had our failures, and we all have had our successes. Uh, Jerry, I assume as director mm -hmm. of a program like Evangel Home, you've had a lot of successes. You've had your disappointments and failures too. And you know, Alan, that is such a great quote. Not only do we all begin there, but when you say learning to walk, I think about those of us that were blessed enough to have people around to help us learn to walk. Oh, yes. As opposed yes, to yes, those yes. so many souls who learn to walk on their own. On their own. You know, those of us that have parents that can move the furniture out of the way and encourage yeah. us, as opposed to those yeah. that just basically and say And it's the same thing yeah. after a failure. They're, we yeah. rely upon the people who help us walk again. Yes. You know, again get up and, and walk, if you will. And that's hard to do. Sometimes that's even harder to do. And yep. that first little step yes, that we... Yes, because you get discouraged, you're oh, afraid you'll you're get hurt, you think why, yep. Yeah, depressed and mad so, and angry, and it all works yep. against you a little bit. <laughs> so Evangel Home, you've worked with Evangel Home for a number of years. They serve women in the downtown Fresno area, women that have fallen on their face, if you will, and you're there to help you know, pick them up. So what was your parenting experience as a child? What kind of parenting did you receive that kind of prepared you for this? I mean, that you would be interested in working with women in this kind of capacity. How were you raised? I was raised in, I guess, sort of an Ozzy and Harriet um, environment. I oh, know yes. that's probably a lot of our listeners now don't even know who Ozzy yeah. and Harriet were. But it was just that nice little middle-class family that mm -hmm. had a mom and a dad. Oh, and yes. I, you know, that's mm -hmm. a huge different demographic. Than From where? We, where are you raised? I was born in Ohio. Ohio, okay. But we're I was raised Midwest. in California. Okay. We, we moved out here when I was three. Okay, well, we're talking uh, California. Then. So, California, <laughs> yeah. Sacramento until I was, uh, until I graduated from junior high. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Fresno, and that was a pivotal year for me because you, your quote about learning to walk, mm -hmm. I realized the upbringing I had until that point, which right. was moral, which was spiritual, which was um, expectations were made of me, consequences mm -hmm. were given if I didn't achieve. I'm nothing terrible, yes. but there was always there were always choices and always consequences. So let me ask you this, did you have a father that pushed achievement? I had a father who pushed pride. All right. He was so proud, you know, he was never, you have to get all A's and yes. why did you get a C? He was always the guy saying you can do it. And okay. you tried your best. That's why you achieved, by the way, if you yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Because the research shows very clearly that it's the father's influence upon a girl. If that girl is going to achieve, it's that father who has said, you can do it, try it, go for it. You know, Alan, it, and we're going to be all over the place, I can tell, because everything you say makes me think of something else. But <laughs> the longer I worked at Evangel Home, which is a shelter for women and kids, the more I saw the need for good guys. And I That's thought right. if, if at any moment I were to have pivoted to another ministry, yeah. I think I would have tried to think of something for men mm -hmm. because without men, we can't do it. I, I saw at Evangel Home how desperate the kids were for a good father That's figure. what kids need yeah. and want and yeah. yearn for. Yeah. And we'll do and all kind of tactics to get a man in their life. Yeah. And Sometimes so their mom are so yeah. favorable, but and they're men. That's right, and that's what happens to mom. Then she doesn't make the best choice because yeah. she's making choices based on the parenting she had, which was often a single parent, sure. or it was men that weren't the best role model. Sure. And so you keep repeating the pattern. Was there one experience in your life, though, that you can kind of go back to and say, that was the pivotal point, that was the experience that led me to be prepared to work with women who need shelter and who need 
a buildup in their life. And need Alan, that kind I don't of think there was one point where, like, I'm 14 and I think this is what I was going to do. But I can yes. tell you the process. Mm -hmm. um, because when I went to college at Fresno State three times, right. the first time I went to change the world. Well, we all did in the 60s. <laughs> we all do that. Yeah, you can't really change the world. But you can change your space and you can tend your garden. You yeah. can change your garden. So I did a number of things, including I taught junior high school, and I liked mm -hmm. it. And if you can teach junior high and like it, uh, that yeah, says something about you. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, I was a probation officer, and I did. Um, I also did public relations at Reedley College. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, I would suddenly just kind of be done with it. I think, okay, I want to try something else. Sure. I go to church in downtown Fresno at First Presbyterian, and so 35 years ago, when I was driving to church, I was always praying, God use me. I, I, that's when I was at Reedley College. I see him. And I'm praying God use me. And I worked for the president at Reedley College. And I, was, I had no desire at that point to get into ministry or to really work with homeless people. I've always been kind of an underdog sort of champion. Ah, that, but, that helped right there. So that helped. That helped. So I'm driving <laughs> to church and I'm doing my prayer for like two years. And then one, and my prayer became use me as a single person. And again, I had no clue mm -hmm. why I ever added that, but God well. knew. So I'm just driving and praying. And then I looked at my church newsletter. This was 1987. I knew the previous director at Evangel Home had passed away. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think, oh, I'm going to go get that job. I hardly at that point knew yeah. what the home was. But when I looked in my uh, newsletter and I saw they were looking for a director, I got goosebumps. Is that right? And those are the kind that of goosebumps kind of you know. Reached yeah. out and grabbed you a little yep. bit, didn't it? Yeah. And so I called Evangel Home, and a lady named Lily Sullivan answered. And Lily was the cook, and she had the most hospitable Southern voice. Uh -huh. And I asked her if they were still looking for a director. And she shared a little with me, and I thought, if they're all like that, that's where I want to work. Wow. And that's and then it was a you know seven month process of going through interviews and it took a long time uh -huh. and I remember arguing with God about why is it taking so long God you know you know the goosebumps that's where <laughs> I'm going there must be so that that was yeah. the process but there were a number of steps along the way that prepared that that's like really a major decision in your life wasn't it oh it was huge I mean it be, you didn't know it at the time but it became then a thirty year decision yes well and the other decision oh, you made were just what a two few three years. four years or whatever. And now, and now you're into a 30-year yeah. decision, but and you didn't know I, it. No, and when I got there, I thought, oh, yeah, right. Because the previous director had been there 17. I see. And I thought, yeah, right, I'm going to be here that long. Yeah. Because I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. I felt yeah. so unprepared. Yeah. Um, but well. 30 years, and, and then I always prayed I w it would be as clear to me when the time to retire was sure. as it was when it to begin. You know, when you uh, work with the homeless, and just leave it at that as a kind of a general population, you have these kind of expectations, you have these images, you have these kind of biases, if you will. What was the thing about you that kind of cleared the way to say, that's a group of people I can work with, rather than avoid and, and stay away from? I mean, it's, it's kind of like, can you approach certain people or avoid people? And these are people that you could deal with, you could be around, you could feel comfortable with, you could feel safe with. What was it? I think, again, my heart was always the underdog champion sort of heart. Teaching junior high, I mean, that, that's a huge thing because well, at junior high, you know, you think you know what you're doing, but you really don't necessarily know. Yeah. And then being a probation officer and uh, dealing with another element. So I right. had dealt with enough elements that there really wasn't one type of person I didn't want to deal mm -hmm. with or work with. Because I think, again, at our heart, at our core, there's always something we have in common. There's yeah. more we have in common. So those are the don't. marginal people, so to speak, mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. out of the junior high into a probation population and then to a homeless population, basically. What yep, a transition. Right. I know. What a transition. <laughs> and I had a great time. I uh, really did. You really loved it. I really loved it. And I think, again, Alan, you can always find something you have in common. Yeah. Um, in, in back of the Evangel Home is an alley. And there were a number of, of alley people that would go through the alley and get in the dumpsters, and that's sure. how they survived. When you begin to know the names of those people mm -hmm. and you have a relationship, even that group of people you can connect with. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have the relationship, and I think that's what's so missing in so much of what we try to do with all of our wars on poverty, our wars on homelessness, our yeah. wars. We mm -hmm. don't know the people. No, we don't. 
But when you do, it's a different population. It's a, I mean, yeah, all of a sudden yeah. they come alive. They become persons. Yes. As compared yeah. to just an image or a shadow or some kind of a caricature yeah. out there, yeah. if you will. Now, now they become a person to you. And that's all we want. We Was there a point in time when you met that moment? when the homeless people became a person to you in your life? I mean, was it like, like a critical moment, like an aha moment in your life? Or did it just kind um, of emerge and kind of grow and I think it, you felt it, more it safe emerged, and comfortable? But there are always people in our lives, I think, that teach us the greatest lesson more than the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and for mine, uh, we had a woman with us named Janice. And Janice was one of those people that never got anything in life she ever wanted. Ah. Um, and was always kind of thrown to the wayside. And, and Janice drove us all to the edge <laughs> <laughs> numerous times. But there was something about Janice. You could always see that child in her that God made. And, and that was the key, Alan. That's what we were always looking for. Looking There's for all that. this junk on the outside. Yeah. Who did God, who did you start out to be? So there's a quality. Then, there's yeah. a soul. There's a, yes. some kind of a substance and you find to it. every person. Yeah. No. And, and you and they you let them find that in you. No, you don't share ah. your deepest, darkest, and your most private lives. And you, that's very important. When I was at Evangel Home, that our staff was separate from yeah. the residents. You have to be. There has to be that. But still, they have to know that you, as a person, really care for them. That's an, that's a profound statement. I want you to go back over that because that really hits you well. So, you have to be vulnerable yourself a little bit mm -hmm. for people to know mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. before you can know them. Right. Is that? I think so, because you can't have anything mutual. If I mean, if it's all one-sided, then I become the authoritarian mm -hmm. or I become the fixer. Mm -hmm. And it can't be that way. Yeah. You, there's got, well, they've got to connect with I think every parent. Yeah. I think every parent, every child. You know, the parent's got to be vulnerable. The parent has to be open up. The parent has to have a soul that the child connects with. Trust. I think that's it. That's trust the bridge the to that is trust. Mm -hmm. And again, the homeless population, for the most part, that, that is at Evangel Home or I bet any other shelter, you look at, I think, two things, Alan, that every one of them, man or woman, would have. One, they come with lack of trust mm -hmm. because their whole lives, they've, they've been, either been used or they've been the ones who did the using. So they know right. that game. That's right. And the other thing they don't have is hope. Mm -hmm. I think lack of hope is... Mm -hmm a bigger factor when than you don't have hope money. you have despair yeah i mean despair is the issue uh, that drives so many people and they're looking for that thing yeah. which we call hope you know something that will be beyond today something that will be on tomorrow that's out there somewhere it's vague yeah but it's there but it's there it's 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 a more important thing i believe than money mm -hmm. lack of hope is more detrimental do you think when you relate to homeless people that that's no different than relating to children. I mean, you have to get to know them. They have to, you have to allow them to know you. There is a sense of safety that you have to achieve. There's a sense of trust that you have to achieve. There has to be this message that you are a person of hope. You carry hope. You bring hope. You are a representative of hope. I, I is that what a parent does? It is. But I think when you're dealing with the homeless population, you do all that, but you never come across as the parent. You can't be the person who knows what no, is best for point. you that's because you're point. dealing with adults. Mm -hmm. And even though many of those adults are sort of frozen as teenagers yes. because of trauma in their lives, yes. you cannot put them in that position where I'm the parent, the parent you're the, the child. child. But you practice those things. I was thinking, Alan, that in, in the Evangel Home parenting class, which is based on nurturing, the oh, nurturing yes. parent, mm -hmm. if the parent hasn't learned to e nurture themselves even, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then the kid is never going to have a chance. So you've got to be nurturing, you've got to have empathy, you've got to give them discipline and self-worth. Those are the very mm -hmm. things we need to give the women. Mm -hmm. So as, as the staff would model and teach those yeah, things to yeah. the women, that's what they would do to their children. Yeah. They're used to coming in and spanking. Well, if that's all you've ever done in your yeah, life, and we say no spanking, well, what am I supposed to do? Which is probably what they received as a, mm -hmm. as a child when they were yeah. a child. That's probably, you do the same thing. Yeah. You do the same thing as a parent as you got as a child. I and it works better for me mm -hmm. if I'm mad at you and than it ever does for the child. <laughs> yeah. It's much more for yeah. the parent, I think. Yeah. How so, do you get, when you said self-worth, how do you teach self-worth? How do you, what's the pathway? that somebody can generate kind of a sense of self-worth that you're, if you're trying to do that, how do you? 
How do you communicate it, it's that? a whole lot easier if you start back at the beginning when they're learning to walk. <laughs> but given that the population that Evangel Home and other shelters... They're way with, down the road. They're yeah. way down the road. So you've got to give them some training wheels. Maybe you've got to give them crutches. You've got to give them things to help them get there. And then you praise them for being who they are. Mm -hmm. You praise them for doing what they do. I remember Alan once walking past someone in the kitchen that was washing the dishes. Yes. Washing the dishes. And I just was trying to think of something to say. And I said, you're doing a great job of washing the dishes. And she said, that's the first nice thing anybody has ever said really? to me. Now, she didn't mean just really? in the evangel. No, but in her life. But in her life. And her I, I kind of doubt it was the first thing. But, but it the first made one an I really remembered or made an, it made an impact. impact on her. And so I yeah. tried to teach the staff. Again, this is how I try to teach the staff the way I wanted them to teach mm -hmm. the women. And it's so easy like with a child, yeah. always point out what they're doing wrong and correct them. Mm -hmm. what, find what they're doing right. Do you think that's almost a general conclusion or principle almost that people who are on the street, who end up on the street, who end up with really kind of no life to speak of, really have had no encouragement. <laughs> they've not had that that's encouragement. I mean, they've not had that affirmation that you, I mean, it's a simple little statement, easy for you to make, but profound for somebody to hear and receive. You wonder if that's almost an absent issue in their life. I think it is. Absent message. I think it is. Wow. That's really where it's, it starts, isn't yeah. it? It's to give somebody a sense of importance or value or that you notice them or you it, notice what they're yeah. doing and what they're doing contributes. And I think when you do that, mm -hmm. there's a lot more internal worth. There's more internal discipline. Um, I see that with kids that in school that they have no internal um, way to control themselves. <laughs> it's all external. Yes. And boy, if you don't get that taken care of mm -hmm. and you become an adult that has no internal controls. Right. But a lot of it begins with praise and expectations. We expect you know? kids and we expect adults, no matter who they are, to make certain decisions. Yes. We, yes. we expect that. Well, there are a lot of them that cannot make decisions. and They've never made decisions. Oh, they you know, do. <laughs> well, are they make decisions that have never really been, yep. you know, result in anything positive or good or a good outcome? So it's been a disappointment. So decision making is not really well learned. And then once you're that disappointed mm -hmm. and you're you've tossed yourself on the trash heap, it's pretty tough to get off. Oh. Because that's your image of yourself is mm -hmm. I'm worthless. And then, <laughs> and thank goodness the Evangel Home is a. a Christ-based shelter mm -hmm. so that all of our worth can be found in our relationship with him. If we can teach, if they can grab that concept, if they can accept him um, and that kind of love, that is, that's the best that we can hope for. But So it's kind of a you, godly foundation mm -hmm, that what mm -hmm. you're trying to say, that's where it starts. If you can get that kind of a foundation in your life and a recognition that God is there and can be part of you from there you go and that's where the love part comes in mm -hmm. because our women have had enough of, of of the reciprocal kind of you know you do this for me i'll do this for you yes they've yes. not had unconditional love and again mm -hmm. that's the relationship mm -hmm. that you get with there jesus hey we're gonna take a break okay and okay. Uh, when we come back from the break i want you to do this give us a kind of a little small synopsis of the kind of person that would end up in a shelter happens to be evangel home but there are other shelters as well that you know who goes to a shelter why do they do that what what do they bring with them so that when they come you as the staff of a shelter can begin to do the process that you're working on and involve them in the program that you have available so what do they bring to you well, let's come back and talk about that get yourself a cup of coffee and we'll see you in a couple of minutes The Green Gables Care Home is a 24-hour assisted living facility for the elderly located in Clovis, California, offering spacious private and semi-private rooms which are wheelchair approved, catering to the special person in your life who needs attention and wants to live in a loving home environment. The Green Gables Care Home has assisted living in secured homes for elderly with Alzheimer's, memory loss, and for your loved ones needing assistance with their activities of daily living. Call 559-297-9438 and visit GreenGablesCareHome.com.
Sometimes good intentions hurt rather than help. For just $1.76 per meal, the Fresno Rescue Mission offers more than food. We offer hope. Please donate today. Do you need a locksmith? Layman's Lock and Safe Service and Repair is available for you. 559-228-1805. Gained a lot, learned a lot, and got a lot of love. If it weren't for the knowledge that I had gained from the classes at PCC, I probably wouldn't be the mom I am today. I would love you to meet my son, Aaron. My situation was very difficult. I didn't know how my life was going to turn out. We graduated in June yeah. 2010, and we got married in July. And through family, the Pregnancy Care Center changed our lives. The Pregnancy Care Center was a huge, vital part in helping me walk through that pregnancy in educating me and loving on me during that time. Choosing a Medicare plan can be difficult and frustrating. Susan Hatch can guide you through the Medicare maze and help find the right plan for you. Susan helps people understand the confusing and drastic changes that occur every year in Medicare. Susan will only recommend plans that will protect your assets and allow you to continue to see your personal doctor. As a 100% independent agent, Susan is not controlled by any particular insurance company to steer a person onto any one particular plan. Susan was awarded the number one Medicare supplement agent in California. Look for Susan's Medicare question and answers every Monday in the Fresno Bee. Call Susan at 559-307-2287 and visit medicaretoday.net. All right, welcome back, and glad you're joining us with the episode today of Dr. Teach Me to Parent. Jerry Brenneman of Evangel Home, retired former executive director of 30 years worth of work and effort at the Evangel Home, and now kind of here reminiscing a little bit and talking about the people that are served at Evangel Home and maybe a lot of other nonprofit organizations downtown, a lot of other shelters, and yours is primarily for women. And uh, you were just, when we took a break, you were just saying that when women come to you, one of the first things that you want them to understand is that you want them to connect with a God in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where, the, it, it, that's like the foundation stone. You want to build from there. But who are these women that come? I mean, many of them are homeless. Many of them maybe come from jail. Uh, maybe they come from prison. They come from various places. Who are they? They're you and me before we learn to walk. Is that you know, right? Or we took a lot of stumbles. Is that right? They uh -huh. are women, um, and, and I need uh -huh. to discern that the homeless population is not monolithic. It's not one level of problem. Yes. A as varied as other levels of society are, so is homeless. Mm -hmm. And I think if you said homeless to 10 people, you might get 10 different answers. You're going to 10 different answers, yeah. But I want to say yeah. the homeless people that are in the shelters, for the most part, are not the ones on the street corner begging for money. Um, and I, I want to kind of I want, divert yeah, a minute because yeah. everybody who works with homeless people yeah. will say part of the problem is that when we give people on the corners money yes. because we are compassionate, we're basically paying them to stay there. That's right. So... That level of homelessness, many of those folks are not homeless. That's mm -hmm. how they're getting their money. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, we've hired them to stay out there That's because right. we're paying them. It's good, good way so of doing I it. So I think mm -hmm. I, people are compassionate, 
but then when they up a couple of levels from mm -hmm. the street are the women that come to the shelters whether it's Evangel Home or Rescue the Children or several other ones. Sure. Many of them have lived a life of insecurity and crisis, just mm -hmm. kind of bumping along, going from thing to thing, mm -hmm. looking for self-worth in all yes. the wrong places. We talked yes, about that. Yes. And then they get to a place like Evangel Home where the expectations are off. They're very different. There's nothing we ask from the women mm -hmm. other than to follow the rules and treat each other kindly. With respect. And, With respect. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so many of them, Jim, we or I'm sorry, um, Alan, uh, we <laughs> would say, what, what, do you, what did you feel when you walked into Evangel Home? Yeah. What? And so often they'll say peace. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's something they've longed it's tranquil. for forever. It's tranquil. Yeah, it's a tranquil environment. They have I've, tranquility I've been, and peace. Mm -hmm. I've been reading things about the importance of silence in our life, that just having uh, a little time of silence and peace, what that does for mm -hmm. us mentally. And when you think of so many of our women mm -hmm. that have known nothing in their lives but cement, mm -hmm. just imagine living your whole life on the sidewalk, in the, on the sidewalk, on in the street. one giant apartment complex after another, one parking lot after another, yes, and mm -hmm. never knowing. And having peace. trains go by, and buses go by, yeah. and cars go by, and the noise of the, the street. Noise. That's yeah. all you know. That's all you know. Wow. And the behavior. And so we get them at all levels of, you know, they're walking, but they're wounded. We get the mm -hmm. walking wounded, basically. And so Evangel Home and other shelters are there to minister, to tend to the wounds, to try to get the person whole, and to, to mm -hmm. help them then become a productive member of society. How long does that it's take? It's a process. Let's, let's assume yes. that you are successful. Let's assume that okay. it works. Are we talking six months? We're talking six years. We're talking the rest of their lives. Now, we learned at Evangel Home that you don't, just because you accept Christ does not mean all your problems go away mm -hmm. and now everything is fine. That's right. Um, and so it's, it's a commitment on their part. Evangel Home has basically three years worth of programs. Three years, okay. And we learned as we went along, 30 days is nothing. Nothing. Um, a yeah. year is beginning to look at their issues. Mm -hmm. Then they need another year to practice. It's like, okay, I've learned so all this So it takes stuff. a person a year to come off the street, come into a shelter, get away from the noise in the sidewalk. It takes a whole year before there's kind of a, a crack, an, an opening, That's what a, we saw. A kind of a softening. Yeah. Now, that, that right? might be different with different organizations. Well, That's what we saw. Mm -hmm. And again, Alan, part of that was the trust issue, that many of the women, they, would, they could go through the steps of a program. Sure. But there wasn't sure. that real change yet. No, that's what I'm talking about, so that change of heart or that change of softening okay. you know, of the person. And then what was yeah. happening is after a year, then they begin to see it, and then it would be time for them to graduate, and they'd be <laughs> gone. Wow. So we added another program where they can stay actually it was up to another year. Now it's up to two more years. Oh. So a woman who graduates mm. from one of the programs can actually be there three years. So you really want stability. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as they leave. And half of the Evangel Home staff, maybe it's not quite half of 20 people, are graduates of the program. Is that was right? always one of my most, that was my pride and joy. Sure. When people would say, what are you happiest about or what was your sure. success? I look back at the staff that were residents. <laughs> I'd imagine many of these women are mothers. They have children somewhere. Sometimes the children are with them. Sometimes they're with a father or grandparent or in some other shelter, perhaps. Uh, parenting is part of your program. Yes. You yeah. want them to learn parenting. They all get that. At different levels, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the woman in the 30-day crisis home who doesn't really want to commit to more isn't going to get no other than role modeling and mm. again don't spank your child and and we've had some of them get really irate what am i supposed to do yeah. or the mom that sits in one corner of the room with the kid over there and she yells at them to do everything uh, uh, those you know those are hard things to learn but yeah. in 30 days we can still we don't that. spank and we don't just sit and yell yeah. there's a lots of alternatives yeah. to that but it takes more than 30 days it takes more than 30 days <laughs> yeah and you know the other thing that's kind of funny, Alan, when we would have people that would come in and look in the nice living room, dining room area and say, where's the TV? Because that's, what they've that's done how their life. they parent. Put the child in front of the TV. Well, what am I supposed to do now? And maybe put themselves in front of the yes. TV yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been that's a very it. passive parenting experience, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
So or many of them. Many of them are very good, and then some of them go overboard, and the child becomes their security blanket, mm -hmm. and they never let the child. They out won't of their let sight. child more than a few feet yes. away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very controlling, and yeah. we call it the helicopter parenting yeah. kind of a you know thing, if you will. So, what are one or two of the things that you really want every mother to understand and to learn the skill it relates to parenting? Give me one or two mm -hmm. parenting skills that you'd really want them to know. Um, Whether they stay every, fifty days or eighty days or three years or whatever, there ought to be a basic parenting skill that you really want them to know. I think that one about praising them. Praise them for being, praise them for doing. Look at what they're doing and always find something mm -hmm. to praise them for. Um, and the whole thing of choices and consequences, that mm -hmm. they need to learn that really early because so many of the moms didn't. Yes. So one yes. of the things we do is we have um, a class in making family rules. Oh, yes. And you talked oh. about my upbringing. Yes. That was one of my favorite things. And I think I saw yeah. that on some TV show when I was seven. They were having a family meeting. And I said, let's have a family meeting. Have, have me. We even had officers in my family. family. Roles. Yes. <laughs> and so that's what we have the women mm -hmm. do. And maybe the, and the family rules, they all are involved, even a three-year-old. And the family rules also go for mom. So mm -hmm. if there's something well, the kids want mom to do. That's right. So one of, you know, one of the families, one of the kid rules was you don't throw the ball in the house. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the child threw the ball in the house and broke the window. Yeah. So now there are consequences. Yeah. And that is just so simple. We don't have to overdo it. We don't have, and I think that happens with a lot mm -hmm. of parents that they mm -hmm. overdo because they don't do something and then there's this horrific reaction. Well, a lot of people have not grown up with rules. Yeah. Or if they've grown up with rules, they've just been in words only and no yeah. consequence and uh, no follow through and rules are okay today, but they're not tomorrow or the next day and they don't mean know, anything. Another thing, when we asked the women what was part of their success, what really helped. Oh, yes. They will always say structure and discipline. As Is much that as right? they might not right? want it, when mm -hmm. a graduate says that, and you know that's what we're hoping she can teach her child, mm -hmm. then you have... Yeah, that's kind of a schedule deal. per day. Yeah. We, we start with a schedule. We yeah. live by scheduling. Yes. And that's a helpful thing. It's a very helpful thing. No successful person has made it without a schedule and discipline. Mm -hmm. That's a profound statement, yeah. by the way. You don't have to be homeless to know that. I mean, anybody yeah. who's going to be successful. Yeah. It's the scheduling. It's the discipline of committing to that schedule yeah. and keeping it. Yeah. No matter what. No matter what. And so we, again, teach the women what we want them to teach the children. So... Are women receptive to this? Some of them. I mean, them. no, they've been on the <laughs> street. I mean, you know, they haven't, they haven't come from that background. You came right. from that background. Right. They don't know what rules are. They haven't had fair rules or honest rules or kept rules. Uh, and you're going to say, we need to talk about this? Do they laugh at you or is this welcome? Well, I wouldn't say it's always welcomed. That's why when you think about, I don't know what the numbers are right now, let's say 300 women a year come to Evangel Home to the Crisis Home. Mm -hmm. Of those 300, let's say 50 apply for the apartments. All right. So, and of those 50, maybe we only have 13 apartments for the women. So yeah. you can see the numbers are small. Very small. The, it's a funnel. And at the top of the funnel, it's very wide. Yes, Lots yes. of stuff's coming in, but there's not a lot going out. Mm -hmm. But the ones so. that are at the bottom of that funnel, that group, that's uh, the, the small group that stays, right. two years, three years, are really the ones you want to work with. Right. Those are the ones right. that you invest in greater. Right, you I have assume. to, yes. Yeah. And you know, one of the programs is called the garden, and that's alternative sentencing. Rather than go to prison or jail, they can be sentenced there. Mm -hmm. And that's a little different population than the homeless, mm -hmm. um, but many yeah. of the issues are the same. They're the same. Many of the issues are the very, same. Very same, yeah. And there are people who want that kind of alternative? Mm-hmm, many. Yeah. And you, so you offer that, yes. you know, and so with, with whatever, for whatever reason they're there, they basically get the same kind of message, I gather what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have a foundation that we start with and then we build on that foundation, no matter why they're there, what their background is or who they are. Or right. We don't have different, a different program for them because it works. The only difference with them is that they live in one house and they're, they're more supervised mm -hmm. and they do not have their children at that phase. Mm -hmm. Because if they are, if they have been in a situation where they're yeah. facing prison, they don't need now to bring the child right into it before they have mm -hmm. begun to heal. So what happens so, to these children? 
you know, when a mother comes, she's got a child there or she has children living somewhere else, she finishes your program, do families re reunite? That's our goal. I mean, is that? Many of them begin the reunification process while the mom is in the program mm -hmm. because that gives the agency a chance to supervise with another agency mm -hmm. holding them accountable. So yeah. the woman is here and maybe the outside agency is here, we're here. That's a, a really good thing. So but you know, a lot of these kids have a mother. Mm -hmm. Where's their father? A lot of these kids don't know their father. They don't know where the father is. The father is absent. He's a phantom father. Do you do anything with fathers? Do you try to bring them into the process? Do you try to identify them? Do you try to reach out to them? I mean, it's a woman shelter. So right. what's the father component, so we to speak? We reach out to the father if the mother wants us to. Mm -hmm. if, if, it's, if it's a bad relationship, we're not in the business of forcing them to restore that. Mm -hmm. um, but if we have counseling for the father, we have counseling for couples, but we have got to take our lead from the mom on that one. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the dream, that's the goal, is well, to I reunite would, the whole family. I would think that you'd want family reunification yeah. if, yes. if you can. But often it's just it's the mom and the children. Because mm -hmm. the father is not there, or there's more than one father, or it's just... So where the are these fathers, generally speaking? I mean, are they where just... Are they? just gone? Are they in the street also somewhere, or...? Some of them. Uh, some of them have a number of children all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, again, Alan, it, it gets back to, to some of the decisions the women make. When they're mm -hmm. so desperate for a man mm -hmm. that they will accept anybody or they'll accept all the lies, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the love lies. Yeah, if you want somebody in your life, you want a companion, yeah. male or whatever, then you'll take whatever yeah. you get. Yeah. And then you go with that, I guess. And get. that's part of that self-esteem. It must hurt you. Yeah. You must really cry at times when you've invested a year, two years, three years in somebody's life, and then you find out a year or so later that they're back where they started. But that I, must really I hurt. saw very few of them go back as far. It, it's like they might slip back, mm -hmm. but they could remember what it was like to be forward. I see. And so maybe they don't go back quite as far. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's painful when you see some that you. In converse to that, it must make you very happy. You know, when you see some of these women going through your program yeah. one year, two years, three years, and now establish their own family or create a new family now and move forward. Is that? That's one of our, um, I told you that one of my greatest delights is when staff, when a staff member is a former resident. Oh, yes. But we now at Evangel Home, there's a board member who is a graduate. I see. Uh -huh. I think, I mean, you can't get better than you that. You can't better. She was the typical person that would come to us, mm -hmm. um, substance abuse issues, three children, uh, no father in the picture. She was all over the place and she went through the program. Um, when we only had it for one year, maybe a mm -hmm. little longer, but she's now on the board. It's been 20 years, but her life just kept going incrementally, mm -hmm. getting better and better. She never looked back. Yeah. That is a joy. That's, 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 that's got to make you very happy. And I would, you know, when <laughs> I was there, Alan, I would have people say, how do you do that? And don't you get... Day it? after day. Day after day. Well, you, mm -hmm. you have to remember our job is not to save any of them. That's God's job. Our job is to serve them. Um, that takes a whole lot of pressure off. Yeah. I don't, that's, you know, we expose them to Jesus, but we don't say, if you don't accept him, you're going to hell and forget all this. Mm -hmm. We want to lead them to him, but he's the one that has to save them. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of pressure off. That takes the pressure off you. So you yeah. go home at night and you also think, I, I don't have to be the only person there in charge yeah. of anything. When mm -hmm. I was gone, there were other staff members mm -hmm. and you learn to rely on each other. Yeah. Because um, everyone in that kind of sure. work has got to get a break. You know, Jerry, you're like every parent. You burn out too. You know, you burn out. Parents burn out. We all get exhausted. We have kids that are hard to raise. You know, kids who disappoint us. And yeah. kids who give us cheer. <laughs> and uh, how, do you, how do you keep going? How do you revive? How do you build up yourself at that moment where you could go into a burnout and just kind of feel like quitting? I think Every that, parent's there. We all know what that is as like. A, as a parent, you can't just walk out of the house, I <laughs> no. suppose. I could do that. I could just walk out of my office. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just think that's the time when you really need to take a deep breath, take a break, and then look at yourself and see what you could do differently. 
you know, there may be. You can't keep going the way you've been no, going. You got to do something different. Added to the burnout. Yeah, um, yeah. And then there are times when you just release it. Now you don't want to release it and do something violent. I think the only violence I ever did at Evangel Home when I got so frustrated <laughs> with Janice, I kicked my chair. Oh, I I, and I thought, ooh, that wasn't good. Yeah, break a pencil or whatever. <laughs> yeah, break a pencil. <laughs> and sometimes, actually, that is such a shock to you uh -huh. and the child, it becomes funny. It's like yeah. when mom spills milk. Yes. You know, if the kid spills milk, you get in trouble. Oh, yeah, that's But when terrible. mom that's spills terrible. milk, it's like, whoa. Right, now we, now we have so now we have something in common. <laughs> but, yeah, I think you somehow, and I think one of the greatest levelers when you're dealing with people even more important than being able to say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. is to be able to say I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Somehow that really levels things. Now, that's not preventing burnout. Um, I just think with burnout, you've got to get away. You've got to have a vacation. Oh, that's another thing. Homeless people don't have vacations. No, they don't. That's when was it. the last time a homeless person took a vacation? <laughs> yeah. Um, that would be a really yeah. good thing to build in. Mm -hmm. That's what some of them look at Evangel Home as. That's their vacation. Like, I was going to say, they go to jail. They go to prison. Yeah. as their vacation. It's their vacation. Clean up, get some rest, get some yeah. structure in their life, and go back and do it again. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that's the place of vacation. So maybe that's so how they avoid burnout. So you may be the place out. of vacation mm -hmm. for some people. And why they don't really go beyond a certain point. You know, they may program for three months, six months, and then quit. They've, they've done their vacation, so to yep. speak. They're ready now to go back to go and back. <laughs> redo what That's they've been doing. That's the sad truth. That's what they know. Good. And you do the thing that you know. So it's, you know, a, it's One of the things we did at the Evangel Home was um, no matter what phase you were in, basically you can come back three times. Mm -hmm. But more than that, you can't because then you keep just doing the same thing over and sure. over. Sure, sure. We're going to take a break okay. and give you a chance to kind of catch your breath here and thought. When, I, when we come back, I want to discuss this with you. What would you tell the average parent watching this program today, the average young parent that's now struggling with kids that you struggle with, <laughs> with the homeless people you struggle with, what are some of the things you'd tell them? What, what guidance would you like to give parents today so that their kids don't become homeless, their kids mm -hmm. don't become failures, you know, their kids don't stumble and never get up again? Let's do that when we yeah. come back from our break, okay? Get yourself a cup of coffee and see you in a minute. who has a passion for superior aesthetics and comfort. You need Dr. Christopher Wong with Cedar North Dental. Call 559-432-4948 or visit cedarnorthdental.com. At Boys and Girls Clubs, it's not just about trying new things. Kitchen, my hometown. It's not about learning the right steps Four. or making contact. Five, six, seven, eight. It's not about exploring the future. It's about helping them build it. It's about taking steps to greatness, about making a connection. It's about proving every kid and teen has what it takes. It's about people in our clubs who bring out the greatness in every kid who enters our doors. It's not just about being on stage. It's about walking across it. Great futures start here, and here, and here. 
Sat7 is a Christian media network that uses uncensored satellite television to broadcast across the Middle East and North Africa and is also available globally online. Pompeii disease is a progressive, multi-systemic, debilitation, and often fatal muscular disease. The United Pompeii Foundation was formed to assist those affected by Pompeii with the medical costs and other expenses that they may not be able to fully cover through their insurance. Visit unitedpompeii.com to learn more and to make a tax-deductible contribution to the United Pompeii Foundation. on the campus to come visit it, I was struck by how open and how welcoming the students and the professors were. Coming to Gordon was like coming home. I think intentional community is what Jesus modeled with his disciples and Gordon has really fostered a good place for intentional community to happen. Gordon is a place where you can meet people from all over the world and hear their stories. I meet a lot of different people who are shaping who I am today. Gordon seeks to graduate men and women of character, of leadership, and the world is the place where Gordon students belong. Choosing to go to Gordon was, I think, one of the best decisions I've made in my life. I expect to be changed. All right, welcome back to Dr. Teach Me to Parent with Jerry Brenneman of Evangel Home and been the executive director of Evangel Home for over 30 years and is now retired in the past five months. So you're still recovering, aren't you? But I asked you before the break, uh, Jerry, in the homeless people you work with, the parents that are at risk that you work with, what do you teach them as a parent in their parenting skills? There must be two or three very important skills that you want them to know and, and just follow and just implement in their life with their own kids? It was not only me thinking something was important. I asked several of the women what did they think was important. I see. Mm -hmm. And one of the top things they all said was learning to be consistent. Uh -huh. um, because, mm -hmm. again, they, they yes, sort I... of parent by mood or emotion, and yeah. then you're giving the child a different... I always call it's it parenting time. by rationality. Yes. You, 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 so you you've reason, got which to means, be consistent. Then you're consistent. What I said yeah. yesterday, I have to say today, yeah. and I have to say tomorrow. Yes. When you yeah. do it by emotion, it, it's it, for it the changes. moment. Yeah. It's all. And then again, it's then it's based on what the mom feels, and it's not at all good for not the child. Not going to be helpful. Um, to realize that each child is different, that mm -hmm. you might have to do a little different um, discipline with. Yeah. Johnny than you do with Susie. That's right. Each, so be consistent. One child you can reason. Mm -hmm. Another child you can't particularly you can't. reason with. You have to levy a consequence of some type. And I think also to, um, to listen to the kids. Um, learn how, what their words really mean. Learn to talk to them. Ask them how they feel about something. We have a, there's a gal in the apartments now. Um, who has a teenage daughter, and that's mm -hmm. really tough to be a that teenager be a in a shelter. Mm -hmm. But as the mom is learning to 
be able to express her own feelings better. Mm -hmm. The child is opening up and, and, mm -hmm. and realizing it's safe. I really can say how I feel. Wow. Very um, important. So, and we have Very another one. Very important. Yeah, Every teenager. It really is. They need mm -hmm. to, and so you might as well learn that when the child is three. You know, how do you feel about this? Um, of course, it's going to be different for each child. Sure. But still, listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps you. So. You know, you have a hobby of collecting uh, certain kind of, I'll call them toys. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can use that as a reward. You know, if a kid behaves well, you have used those little toys that you have as a reward. Tell us how you do that. Well, and I want to say again to the moms that that's a really good thing. Like if you get back to family rules sure. and you go for a week and your kids have followed the rules, make a special thing for them. Do mm -hmm. something special with them. Those rewards. Very important. Um, and we talked about diversion. So I had a, I have a Pez collection, a personal Pez collection, in case people forget what they are. They're these little guys. Candy comes out. Well, I had in my office, I had a bathroom and a medicine uh -huh. cabinet, and I stocked the medicine cabinet with Pez. And I can't tell you, Alan, the look on a kid's face when I would say, come in here, I have something for you, because yeah. they were being really good or they needed to be diverted. I'd stand them on a chair, open the medicine cabinet mirror, and it was lined with Pez. And you would have thought the child had just won a trip to Disneyland. Sure. It was unexpected. It mm -hmm. was fun. It was mm -hmm. theirs. They got to choose one. Mm -hmm. And just that little thing, I, I saw moms kind of pick up on that. Sure. About, well, I could have something, you know, a special uh, bag with, with toys in it sure. for when they're good. So you know, we that usually was a think good if example. we're going to reward a kid, we give them something. Yeah. Even to eat or something to have. Well, this is the idea of that they may have 15 minutes of playtime with this or a half hour of playtime, but they give it back and mm -hmm. they can or they can do keep it again. It. I might let them keep it. You might even let them keep it. Or the next day they get to come and get candy because they're not worth much to the kids if there's no candy. Yet. That's also true. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is but rewarding good behavior. Yes. Appropriate behavior, yeah. desired behavior. And having fun with it. Mm -hmm. And for the mom to be just excited at that point as the child is, that, that's, you know, that's just a good bonding kind of thing. Yeah. To enjoy your kids. Have fun. Really have fun with them. I mean, they're such little treasures. We are their stewards, and they need a lot of care. And, mm -hmm. yeah, so enjoy them. Yeah. Enjoy them. Do you have a success mm -hmm. story? Do you have somebody that can just maybe in a minute, you can give us just kind of a summary of somebody's life that kind of came in, and they left after a period of time, mm. but then went on with life and him became a little bit successful or maybe very successful, if you will. You know, success is varied, but just were better off and then they came and they moved on in their life. Yeah. Well, I told you about Jeannie, who is now on our board. Okay. But mm -hmm. we, one of our, um, and I, I want to say, Alan, anybody who needs help from Evangel Home yes, will ask. give their phone call, their yes. phone number later. Yes. Um, Janelle, who is our morning house manager and often answers the phone, Janelle is a graduate of the Garden um, mm. Alternative Sentencing. Mm -hmm. And she came to the crisis home, I don't know how many years ago, 10, 12, 15. Um, she was in an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. She came to the crisis home, she was there a few days, and she decided to leave. And she remembers me saying to her, well, I think you're making a mistake, but so long. Because it's not up to me to convince her yeah. to stay. We did everything we could. So she went back to the abusive situation. Later, she ended up getting in trouble and ended up being sentenced to the garden. She was in the garden, the alternative sentencing, with a, a wonderful group of women. Mm -hmm. they, they refer to themselves as the garden girls. They just I developed see. this personality, mm -hmm. these six residents. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And, every, and most of, I can think right off the top of my head, three of, one of them is a minister now in Paraguay. I, I mean, she's doing ministry. It's incredible. But Janelle then eventually got on our staff. Um, her son, who is now 19, I think, um, as a young man developed leukemia while she was still with us sure. for us to be able to support her and him and he is fine now he's this strapping strong young man mm -hmm. but the leukemia and all of that what he experienced at evangel home as a child um he's now doing youth ministry and so you see the ripple effect from us to mom from us again to mom to him mm -hmm. and it goes yeah. on and it goes on and, on and on. It's that ripple that is just... So really, success is when somebody can take what you 
taught them and then teach someone else yes or benefit yes. somebody whether else, it's or a child or someone else, else in, because in a way. not all of the women who come to evangel home have kids that's right um but every one of us is a pebble and every mm -hmm. one of us has ripples you know i like this quote that i'm going to use a kind of okay. end and then we're going to come back and talk about how somebody can connect okay, okay. with uh evangel home but this is an interesting quote that you just said maybe i may comment on it life is like a tennis game the one who serves seldom loses. Mm. Now, serving mm. in tennis is different than serving mm. in life. But I, I gather you teach these girls how to serve others. Yes, because at some point, that's what a healthy person does. Mm -hmm. We serve others. We're that's not always waiting health. for other people to come to us. Mm -hmm. I, even like if you are the kind of, if you're shy and you're always standing in the corner waiting for people to come to you mm -hmm. and they don't, mm -hmm. and then you of course get hurt feelings, nobody loves yes. me. Well, get out of that and mm -hmm. step forward. Even, even that could be serving. It would be. You know, just yeah. being able to say hello. But Now Evangel Home serving. is located in downtown Fresno. Mm -hmm. And uh, give us a telephone number. If somebody wanted to connect with uh, Evangel Home for maybe different reasons, uh, we'll talk about that, but uh, what's the number that you uh, would have them call? I don't think they he, changed that it. The screen. It's 559-264-4714. So say that one time again, and we'll put that on the screen. Okay. Make sure that we have it, and you can connect with Evangel Home for whatever reason you may want to do so. 559-264-4714. Okay. And let me interrupt myself. Yeah. Because we're living in such a screen internet some pressing the keys world. Yes. I, as the director, and I think Sarah Dawson, who is the current director, probably also screens the email that comes to Evangel Home mm -hmm. from the website, from Facebook. So a woman finds us on Facebook and emails us. We are not just sitting at a computer waiting for her email. Yes. And I, that used to be so heartbreaking to me. I would see women send emails and say, I need help. Well, maybe five hours later, I see it, I yeah. respond, and then I don't hear. Yeah. They have to call. I mean, we'll Calling respond, is but call is the best. Yeah. So if um, somebody out there wanted to make a donation to Evangel Home and had a several hundred dollars wanted to contribute, they would call that number. Call that and number. And then they could connect and make mm -hmm. arrangements for that donation. And there are also, we have a, a landing page on the website for donations. So they can go to the website and see how to give. And then they well, can give directly that You better tell us what the way. website is there as well. Um, Evangelhome.org. Pretty Evangel easy. Evangelhome.org. Mm -hmm. That's all they need. That's all they need. So, they don't have to mess with the WWWs unless they want to. Okay. <laughs> so then if a lady out there in the street somewhere wanted to be considered for services, wanted to think about maybe becoming part of your program, they just call the number? Call the number is the best. What do they do? They come for like a visit? They come, come for, No, uh, they come for an interview. And, and I need to let people know we do not have a um, robot menu system on the, the, it's not a phone system where you have, you talk to a real person. Ah. I, I, that was always one of my things, Alan. I couldn't imagine um, you call, you're desperate, you get a, yes. a recording that said, you know, if you're homeless, press one. If you're being abused, <laughs> press two. If you're just hungry, press three. That just frust That's that frustrates terrible. me to and, death. Well, it's so, contrary to all that you're doing. Yeah. So that that was just one of those things. You can't talk about a personal things. relationship no. and then have. No. A telephone system that's impersonal. Yeah. So it doesn't work. That's where it begins, <laughs> is right then. And then they set up an interview. Uh, over, they do an interview over the phone. Mm -hmm. and pretty much screen a person that way. Then they come in for a real interview. And at that point, that's when the decision is really made. Mm -hmm. So would I have to wait if I wanted to become part of the program there? And let's say it does intrigue me. and It is something I'd like to do. Is there a waiting list like three months or three years? No, we don't keep a waiting list, but everyone who, be, who, everyone who gets into the apartments, that program starts in the crisis home. So you would start in, start the, crisis in the crisis home. home. And you might have to wait a few days, but the turnover in the crisis home, you would eventually ah, I see. So basically yeah. it's not a long wait if no. that was the case. Yeah. And so, well, you have been extremely informative. Well, thank you. You've been you an have. excellent uh, representative of Evangel you, Home. I hope so. I but learned something. I think something. of parenting. You've, you've talked about parenting with tough people, tough kids, tough situations. But that applies to all parents. I mean, every parent has a tough situation. Yeah, exactly. You know, we all define it differently. You know, our kids are not necessarily homeless and not necessarily beating us all up and abusing us. But there's still tough kids to yeah. raise. Yeah. And you've given a lot of good advice. And I think that we need to have space between us and our kids. If, if we're living our lives That's through right. our kids, we're all in trouble. You're still the mother. 
You're still the parent. Mm -hmm. You're not the buddy. You're not the friend. You're not the companion. That difference has to be well yeah. understood. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> and I you, appreciate you. Uh, you being here. And uh, connect with Evangel Home if you'd like to make a donation or if you know somebody that would like to be part of that program. This is your opportunity to act on it, okay? Bye for now. Look at and your off color. we go. Did you see your color in the background?